Okay, hi, good evening. It's good to be here with you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about acupuncture in the oncology field um, this evening. Um, before I go into talking about that, I'll just introduce myself a little bit. Um, I'm an acupuncturist who has a biomedical background. So I did a first degree in medical biology that led to pharmaceutical research. I was a cell biologist. Um, and I realized afterwards that wasn't what I wanted to do. So I went back and did a second degree about 10 years ago in acupuncture Chinese medicine. So because of that, um, I might be a little bit different to other acupuncturists in terms of um, how I talk about acupuncture and how I view it as well. Um, I quite like understanding both sides of the coin a little bit. Um, I find it enhances my clinical practice here. Um, my patients also seem to appreciate the fact that I understand the, obviously the medical world that they're in, understand the medications, diagnosis, those kind of things. Um, but I am a holistic practitioner. So this word holistic that we hear a lot these days basically just means the whole. So when we work with people, if they're coming to see me, for example, for something like nausea and vomiting, we will talk about that and I will treat that. But I'll also ask them questions about other parts of their body as well and possibly treat if there are some side effects and symptoms there. So yes, I have a biomedical understanding, but I am a holistic practitioner still, okay? Um, I've been working with cancer patients specifically for about three years now. Um, I met Gavin Marks, um, or Associate Professor Marks, because we shared a patient for about two years who did really well through her cancer journey. And then Gavin asked me if I'd like to come on board and work with him. So I work with the Northern Hematology and Oncology Group on a couple of days a week, and I work here at the Cancer Support Centre also. I also work in a clinic in North Sydney, but that's more seeing stressed out business people, so a little bit different to the world out here, yeah. Okay, so let's go on and start talking about acupuncture in oncology. I always like to start with this slide because it amuses me a lot. Um, basically a picture of a woolly mammoth being shot in the backside with um, spears from a uh, caveman. And his comment is, that's odd, my neck suddenly feels better. Yeah. Um, Acupuncture is an ancient therapy, obviously, as we know. You know, more than two millennia ago it was formulated. But in all seriousness, in the last probably 15 to 20 years, we've started looking at acupuncture with new perspectives. So some examples of this outside of the cancer world we're gonna talk about are in the IVF world. Most big IVF companies have acupuncturists working with them these days to help women conceive. Um, in the HIV world, a lot of the support centers and treatment centers also have acupuncturists working to um, deal with the side effects of medications and the side effects of the disease as it progresses. And of course, in the cancer world, um, a lot of the large treatment centers across the globe these days, such as the Dana Farber Institute in Boston, we've got Christie's Hospital in Manchester, and the San Hospital in Moringa, um, have acupuncturists working with them to treat the side effects of biomedical cancer therapies and basically try and increase the patient's quality of life a little bit. Um, so yeah, you might wonder why we're seeing acupuncture in the cancer world. Um, as we know, cancer rates are only increasing, unfortunately. But at the same time as that happening, we are getting better and better medication and treatment processes. That is evidenced by, of course, people surviving their cancers, more and more people surviving. With long-term survival, it generally means long-term medication. With long-term medication, often, not always, we see some side effects that can affect quality of life. Some of these side effects are not particularly severe, so they don't really affect people's day-to-day -day life. Other people have side effects that really do make an impact on people's quality of life. In a biomedical situation, if someone comes with a side effect from a medication, one of the doctors might prescribe you medication for the side effects of that medication. And that can work really well. So for example, if you end up with flushing, they might give you something that stops the flushing and that can work well. For other people, the side effects um, aren't managed very well with medication, or they end up in a cycle of taking medication for medication for medication, which obviously isn't an ideal situation. Um, so patients and doctors in the cancer field kind of looked outside this biomedical box and thought, what other modalities are there that we could use? And acupuncture is one of those that has been looked into and researched quite a lot in this situation probably mainly because acupuncture is drug-free. So there are no interactions with the medication or the treatment processes that people are going through when they're in the cancer world. 
Um, there are minimal side effects. Most of my patients will tell you the worst side effect is a small bruise that they might get with the needles. Um, we're seeing a lot more research, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later actually, showing that acupuncture is clinically effective. So it, that means that we have a lot to draw on as acupuncturists, but also patients can read more about the effects of acupuncture out there these days. Um, this word holistic again that we talked about before, because acupuncture is holistic and we don't just talk about one specific symptom, we talk about other symptoms, we can also treat more than one symptom in an acupuncture session. I will just qualify here though that I have got patients who have a long list of symptoms and I don't put a needle for every single one of those symptoms into them. Um, but what we normally do is if there is a long list, we look at the things that are most important and we address those first and then we might review the other symptoms later and see if they still need treatment. But we can look at more than one symptom I think is the point there. Acupuncture is well accepted these days, so most people know of acupuncture, they've heard of it or experienced it or know someone that has. And the last point here, which always makes me get a little bit, that patients report finding an increased sense of well-being and they find it relaxing. One of the oncologists, one of the main oncologists over there who often refers his patients to see me, often says to his patients in front of me that he can't understand how having small needles placed in your body could ever be relaxing. And his patients always say to him, but it is. Um, and actually from a biomedical perspective, we can explain this. The research has shown that when we give someone acupuncture, our body releases endorphins. Endorphins are those feel good chemicals. So hence that increased sense of well-being and the relaxation state as well. So there is a reason behind it. And I will get him on my table at one point to uh, prove the point but not just yet. Um, I'm just going to do some really basic theory of acupuncture. It's obviously a huge subject and I'm not going to go into it in great detail but um, in, a, in a basic sense, have you all seen this, these sorts of diagrams before? Most people? No? Okay. Um, so these diagrams are showing the channels of acupuncture on the body. So more than two millennia ago, the Chinese mapped out these series of channels on the body. Um, they described them as um, networks of interconnecting channels that run all over the body. And I often liken these to the blood vessel network or the nerve vessel network in the body. Okay. Very similar. All right. But instead of having blood or nerve impulses that flow through these channels, there's this concept of energy or chi that we talk about that flows in these channels. Um, the very, very basic premise of Chinese medicine is that if there is smooth flow of energy in these channels, if there's no blockage or disruption, if there's enough energy to flow nice and smoothly, someone is said to be in good health, okay? If there is disrupted flow, if there's a blockage, if there isn't enough energy to make smooth flow, then often we see signs or symptoms and possibly ill health. Again, if you liken this to the blood vessel network or nerve vessel network, if there was a blockage in a blood vessel or the flow wasn't smooth in there, you would see some side effects and symptoms and possibly ill health again. So again, I see them as being quite similar things. Not the same, but similar things there. Um, so, as an acupuncturist, how we take this and translate it into an actual treatment is that we sit with someone when we first see them and we do an initial consultation where we talk to them about the reason they've come, obviously. So, it might be that they've come for nausea and vomiting. We talk with them about that symptom. We ask them when they feel it. Is it all the time? We ask them how it feels. Is there anything associated with the nausea and vomiting other than nausea and vomiting? But we also talk about other systems in their body. We talk about the lower digestive function. We talk about headaches. We talk about energy. A whole lot of questions. So we end up with this big amount of information. And from all of that information through our training, we can generally see patterns that are emerging from those patterns, we choose which one of these or a number usually of the channels that we want to use to treat the side effects and symptoms that person has come in with. On the channels, you can see the little dots running along the channels. They're called acupuncture points or acupoints. Um, and each one of those acupoints, there's over 300 on the body, which as practitioners, we have to learn the exact location and all obviously all the indications of those. Each one is anatomically located, so very specifically located. And by that I mean that they have, we find them using some of the landmarks on the body, like the bones and the muscles. 
but also the Chinese formulated this system of proportional measurement that was really clever actually because obviously someone, not, not one person is, the, is alike exactly, but if you use proportional measurement in the body you can find a specific acupuncture point and then you find it with the anatomical location as well. So the point is that these are not random points. <laughs> they are very specific points. Um, some of them do map in with the nerve vessel networks, but not all of them. And the indications are not the same as would be for that nerve channel either. So after we've decided which channels we'll use, we'll, we'll, we'll decide which one of those acupuncture points is indicated for use. And then we'll insert really fine needles into the acupuncture points. The idea being we're trying to increase the circulation, smooth out the circulation of energy, balance the body a little bit, and help to reduce those side effects and symptoms. Has everyone seen the needles before? Have seen, you've seen them before? No? I've got some here. I'll pass them around. Um, actually, I'll, tell you, I'll just pass these ones around here so you can open them. Here, I'll open one and take one out. They are obviously all sterile needles. They're only used once and then thrown away. We no longer autoclave needles and reuse them, unlike in other places. So needles, so this sort of big, this brass part here is the handle of the needle, OK? And then the actual needle is this part here. So tiny, yeah. They are different lengths, obviously, depending on what part of the body that you're going to be putting them into. But yeah, you just pass that around. Keep hold of it, tiny. I'll just get you to pass that. <laughs> I'll just get you to pass that round as well. Careful there with that. <laughs> Health and safety. Did you put that in the end? That actually revives consciousness, so we might use that a little bit later. Um, OK, so really basic um, theory of Chinese medicine, OK? 2,000 years done in about, um, sorry, two millennia done in about five minutes. But that's the basic premise, essentially, of what we're looking at there, OK? I'm going to go on and talk about research a little bit. Um, for acupuncturists who want to work in the medical world, I personally feel research is really important. Um, like biomedicine is basically our chosen form of healthcare in the society. And so if an acupuncturist wants to work in that situation, they need to understand the research and also, um, and also you know, understand what's going on there. So when we look at research, um, you may have heard that early acupuncture research wasn't really well accepted by the biomedical community. There was good reason for that. The early research that was produced was um, of pretty poor quality. So um, the early trials didn't use things like controls in the trials. They didn't address placebo. They didn't look at randomizing or using double blind studies. All these things that are used in clinical trials these days. Um, the other really big problem is that biomedicine as a healthcare concept and Chinese medicine as a healthcare concept are inherently different. So trying to explain one in terms of the other is, is really difficult. That being said, in the last 15 to 20 years, there's been a lot better quality acupuncture research produced that is now accepted by the biomedical community to varying degrees. Um, so as acupuncturists, again, this means that we have extensive clinical data now to draw on, which I personally see as a really positive thing, obviously. Um, the World Health Organization on their website has a review of all of the acupuncture trials that have been produced between certain dates. I think it was up to about 2002, so we want another one to be produced soon, actually. But in this review paper that you can find on their website, they Basically, the first condition that was listed as effectively treated by acupuncture was adverse reactions to chemotherapy and radiotherapy. What that means is that there was a lot of information about that subject, a lot of clinical trials that showed without a doubt that there was a significant impact if we treated nausea and vomiting from chemo and radio with acupuncture. There's also on that website, in that first list, um, leukopenia um, was listed as clinically um, effectively treated by acupuncture as well. You know what leukopenia is? No? It's a reduced white blood cell count. So leukocytes, sorry. So yeah, that was um, seen as being you know, effectively treated by acupuncture. Um, I'm going to go on in this last little section and just talk about some of the commonly treated symptoms, some of the symptoms I see a lot in the clinics here at the hospital. Um, the first one I've just mentioned, there's a lot of information about nausea and vomiting being treated effectively by acupuncture, okay? Generally, trials report about a 68 to 90% improvement in symptoms after being treated with acupuncture. Um, 
a systematic review showed that um, out of 12 randomized placebo controlled trials, so this randomization that we're looking for, these proper sort of clinical trials, that 11 of them showed significant improvement in symptoms over 2,000 patients. So there's a really good depth of information there that shows that there is effective treatment um, offered there. For myself in <coughs> clinic, nausea and vomiting is something that generally responds really, really well to acupuncture. So yeah, I see quite a bit of that. Another symptom I treat a lot is hot flushes, predominantly from ongoing medication. Um, I have a lot of breast cancer clients um, who are taking aromatase inhibitors, which produces basically hormones which produce hot flushes. With the prostate cancer patients that I see, it's often things um, like Zolodex or um, the androgen ablation therapies producing the hot flushes. We know that it's about 80% of cancer patients on hormone therapy um, who are affected by hot flushes. And of that, there's about a third of the patients who say that the hot flushes are the most troublesome side effect that they get. Um, in clinic, when we treat hot flushes, what we tend to see is that the intensity and the frequency of the hot flushes reduces. So we don't necessarily see that the hot flushes completely go away. Um, I've put a little note here saying set expectations. Whenever I work with any patients, but specifically when I work with cancer patients, I'm really clear about setting expectations. And what I mean by that is I normally start off by saying that acupuncture is not a cure-all for everyone. It doesn't work the same for every person. Um, we don't always get the same results that we did with the previous person. That's been something that's been viewed as quite negatively to do with acupuncture in the past. But then if you think about from a biomedical perspective, not everybody responds to drugs in the same way. Not everyone has the same effects from all the medication as well. So there is some sort of likenesses there from both sides of the coin, if you like. Um, but yeah, I always let people know that. What I usually say to people, what I recommend is for them to come and see me once a week for four consecutive weeks. And the reason that I say that is because I generally find within four weeks of treatment, consecutive weeks, if you're going to have a change or a, an improvement in your symptoms, it will happen in those four weeks. Um, it's essentially like trying to teach the body to do something differently, like learn a new language when we start doing acupuncture. We want it to do things differently. And so if people were coming in every other week or once a month or something, it would be very hard to get those messages through and keep them going. So once a week for four weeks, we normally find in the first couple of weeks that there's not a big change at all. But in the third and fourth week, people often start to find small improvements possibly. This is a sort of average that I'm giving. Some people come back after the first week and they told me that they've reduced massively. And that does happen. But generally, in about four weeks, we see changes. If we got to week four and there was no change, I might recommend doing two more sessions, so six consecutive weeks, because a lot of the research is based on at least six weeks treatment. If we got to week six and there was no change, I would be saying to that patient, I don't think this is going to work for you because I'm not going to carry on seeing someone if they're not getting the results they want. And again, for me, I want them obviously to get the results too. But generally, within these first four treatments, we see a reduction in symptoms. When we get to week four, we always review with patients, how are you th what are you thinking, how are you feeling, and we make a plan going forwards. The idea with acupuncture is not that people have to come and have acupuncture every week for the rest of the time that they're on this therapy. The idea is to reduce the symptoms until they're manageable. So they might still be there, but they're at a manageable level. And then the idea is that every now and again, you have a top up as and when you feel it's needed. So probably that would be when you start to see the symptoms coming back a bit more, if they do, then you'd have a top up and hopefully reduce those symptoms down. Okay, so really important for me working in this field with setting expectations. So with the hot flushes, back to that again, um, there was a study done with prostate cancer patients on androgen ablation therapy, which is essentially like your Zolodex, that sort of hormone therapy in 2011, that showed um, acupuncture reduced the hot flushes 68 to about 89% on average. Um, they found that this effect of acupuncture was similar to some of the medications. So it's interesting. So the medication acupuncture had similar effects, similar rate of success, I should say, but that the acupuncture group didn't have the side effects from the medications. So dry mouth, digestive issues, fatigue, and then also there's increased cardiovascular risk with some of the medications they use for treating hot flushes. In another study in 2009, there was a study on auricular acupuncture. Have you heard of auricular acupuncture? Yeah. 
So there was a study done on auricular acupuncture for hot flushes, um, again prostate cancer group taking hormone therapy, and it showed that after 10 weeks of treatment there was a 95% decrease in the severity of the symptoms. So this is an interesting model in a way because it's just done on the ear, it means that you don't have to be lying down for it. So some clinics, I know of one in the UK, um, have a room with a number of people in the room and they treat them all at the same time, which reduces cost, it's NHS based, um, reduces cost obviously and it means that a number of people can be treated at the same time. So it's a model that you know I'd love to see in Australia sometime, whether we'll get that far um, in my work lifetime, I'm not sure, but it's something that's quite interesting that can be looked at. Um, this is kind of interesting here at the bottom. The studies that are done on acupuncture um, with actually lots of kinds of patients, but also in the cancer in the cancer world, they often show that the acupuncture treatment group report improved physical and emotional well-being. So as well as having improvement in symptoms, the physical and emotional well-being is increased. Now again, we can explain that by the endorphins we talked about previously being released, but this obviously can be a really positive secondary aspect of treatment with acupuncture as well. Fatigue is probably the most common symptom that I treat in clinical practice here at the hospital. Um, it affects 50 to 90 percent of cancer patients. Um, so yeah, we see it a lot. I always say that it's such a small word for such a big number of symptoms. Um, when we talk about fatigue, are we talking about general body fatigue? Are we talking about mental fatigue, which can encompass obviously things like motivation, that also the mental emotional picture can come into that. So stress, anxiety, depression, insomnia, these are all labels. I don't particularly like labels, but they're words that we use. Um, physical fatigue obviously is in there as well. So when we work with fatigue, I always nut out, which part are we talking about here? Are we talking about the mental emotional side? Are we talking about the physical side? Um, yeah. Um, I actually think that fatigue is one of those symptoms that is treated and recognised the least out of a lot of the symptoms. People tend to think of fatigue as someone being a little bit tired and they just need to have a rest and then they'll feel better, whereas the reality is that couldn't be further from the truth basically. And I think because of this that there are more and more calls for cancer patients to be screened regularly for fatigue so that it is acknowledged, it is seen and it is treated. Um, <coughs> If someone's, if the fatigue is quite bad and if there's a mental emotional aspect in there, that's going to affect every single part of that person's life, the day-to-day -day life as well as obviously months and months and onwards. And in terms of fatigue also, I think people often think that fatigue only happens when people are having treatment, you know, when they're going through chemotherapy, whereas we now know also cancer-related fatigue lasts for months or years after someone has finished their treatment. So, yeah. Um, in the research side of things, there was a group of Manchester studies, so done in Manchester in the UK, between Manchester School of Nursing and Christie's Hospital in the UK. Um, in 2007, they did their initial study that showed a 36% improvement in fatigue scores after just six sessions of acupuncture. And in 2012, they released the follow-up study that had over 300 patients that again showed significant improvement in the fatigue scores. Um, yeah, and working with patients in clinical practice here, a fatigue, I have found fatigue to be improved by acupuncture. It's not a fast fix though, obviously, because if it is really ingrained and it's there, it's something that is, you know, needs to be worked on. But I'd say this six sessions of acupuncture is probably quite accurate, depending on the severity of the fatigue. I'd say six initial sessions and then possibly follow-up sessions in the future along those lines, yeah. So on to pain. Um, Pain is probably the most common reason people see acupuncturists. Um, a lot of back pain, that's a lot of, re a lot of the reasons people have often seen someone, um, sought someone out for acupuncture. Um, acupuncture analgesia, as it's called, is well known to be effective for acute and chronic pain, both of them. Um, lots and lots of trials and studies out there if you want to look at those. Um, in the cancer world, we know that about 50% of cancer patients talk about having significant pain that affects their quality of life. Um, so again, biomedical in a biomedical situation, if a patient comes with pain, we offer them medication for that pain, pain meds. Pain meds work really well, usually initially. Um, there are some problems with the side effects of pain medications, um, such as the chronic constipation a lot of patients have. And also there's the risk of dependence there too. Um, so 
so yeah, the medications work really well. What I tend to hear from my patients is that they're really sick of taking medication. That's probably the first thing. And the second thing that the pain meds worked really well and then their, re their effectiveness was reduced. So they needed to up the dose and that worked really well and then it was reduced. And then at some point, the level of medication that's taken can have an effect on the clarity of the mind or on cognition. And that can often be really distressing for patients too. Um, acupuncture, you know, the, a lot of the reviews have shown that um, it does reduce these pain scores. Um, and so it really could be a treatment of choice for pain. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Is peripheral neur neuropathy something that any of you have? A bit of it. A bit of it in the, the altered sensation in the fingers and toes? In the feet. In the feet, yeah. Okay. It, it hasn't been properly diagnosed as that, but yeah. I think that's what GP thinks it is. Is that from um, medication, from chemo? No? Okay. Just nerve pain in the feet. Okay, yeah. So in the in cancer world, we see um, quite a bit of peripheral neuropathy with some of the breast patients and some of the um, bowel patients, and that's due to the chemotherapy. A lot of the platinum-based chemotherapies can produce this as a side effect. Um, diabetes patients also get peripheral neuropathy and other patients as well. So. Um, so yeah, it can be kind of altered sensation in the, in the fingertips usually or in the feet as well. Um, it can be challenging to treat as a symptom. In the last, I think, four years, there's been a lot of um, research and money pumped into acupuncture and peripheral neuropathy um, because there were some positive, in the pilot studies, some positive results shown. Um, so I think in the last two years, there's been about five studies released with varying results um, but most of them showing that acupuncture has had an effect in improving um, peripheral neuropathy. Um, we also do something called electroacupuncture. Have you heard of that? No? Mm -hmm. Electroacupuncture, it sounds a bit scary, it really isn't. <laughs> electroacupuncture is when we basically have a little machine that produces an electric current and we pop electrodes onto the metal needles. And the effect is that um, when you have acupuncture, you often can feel a little stimulation when you first put the needle in. But then when I leave you to relax, it's just a nice calm sensation with nothing really there at all. When you put the electroacupuncture machine on the needles, you feel a more constant stimulation. It's not painful. People sometimes describe it as tapping, like this. If it's turned up high, which we don't turn it up high, it is painful, yes, but we're very careful with the level we set it at. The idea or the reason behind that constant stimulation is that those that area is getting more stimulation through the treatment, so it's like a stronger treatment in a way. Um, and I've had some really good results in the last few months with quite severe peripheral neuropathy with people. Again, it hasn't completely gone away, but people who weren't able to control their pen to write anymore are now able to write, you know, so that twitches kind of go away. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of it's an, interesting, um, an interesting one to treat. Um, there are some studies, as I said, that have shown some improvement and significant reductions in those symptoms there as well with acupuncture. Um, there's a couple of um, symptoms I haven't mentioned on here um, that might be relevant to you as a prostate cancer support group. So one of them would be problems with urination. Um, so either incontinence or the smoothness of the flow of when you're urinating. This isn't something that I've treated or seen a lot in the hospital here, but it's something I have treated in the past with some success. Again, there are lots of studies that talk about acupuncture treating issues with urination. So if that's something that you're um, experiencing, it might be worth having a look at that and start finding some studies. The other one as well that I've not written on here because I haven't come across it very much in the hospital is erectile dysfunction as well as problems, you know, as a side effect of um, prostate cancer surgery or the hormone treatment. Um, and again, there are some studies. I know there was a fairly recent study done with HIV patients um, using acupuncture to improve um, erectile dysfunction with some success. Um, I would say on that matter that you'd really want to look at the reason why it's there. Has it come from as a result of surgery, hormone treatment, mental emotional factors, all of the above? And I would also say that if you were considering getting acupuncture for that symptom, to find a specialist in that area. And there are some, and predominantly men actually, who are specialist acupuncturists in that area. Um, I have names of those people, so if anyone is interested, you can send me an email. I'll give you my email at the end. Um, so yeah, the last thing I want to just touch on before I finish up is emotional conditions. Now, 
I've talked about the emotions through the talk a little bit, especially in terms of fatigue. Um, I think it's really important to address the emotional side um, with cancer patients. Going through the journey of being diagnosed, treatment, hopefully surviving the cancer, and then either just living with the fact that you've had cancer or ongoing medication, side effects, that sort of thing, can be really wearing on the emotions. Um, as I said before, with the fatigue, the mental emotional side, it's not something that's been acknowledged that much in the past. Um, the biomedical community now does see links between the mind and the body. Obviously, in the acupuncture sense, it's always been talked about in that side, but there is research and there's evidence showing that they do affect each other. Um, so hopefully, we'll see more of the mental emotional side being addressed in a slightly better way in the future. Um, it is something that we address in the treatments with acupuncture, um, but I also would urge anyone that's going through that to speak with their oncologist about that too. Um, okay, just to wrap up before I finish, um, I just want to say that as we're seeing more of the cancer centres offering acupuncture as part of their treatment process, that gives us more clinical data um, to draw on as acupuncturists, as patients and obviously your doctors as well. Um, it gives us more evidence that acupuncture does have a role to play in um, the treatment of these side effects of biomedical cancer therapies. Overall, the end goal being hopefully to improve the quality of patients' lives. Okay, thanks. And there is my email. Question time. As well as cancer-related um, treatments, do you do treatment for any other kind of conditions? I do, yes. So um, I actually, funny, I actually work, not funny, I worked in the IVF world for a long time. I worked in Sydney IVF on Kent Street. Um, I worked, I actually set up the HIV treatment acupuncture clinic in Surrey Hills at Acon too, so I um, helped manage the setup of that. Um, but data sort of week to week wise, as acupuncturists we can pretty much treat anything that comes our way within reason, qualify that, that obviously there are some things that you know we won't treat, but generally what I treat, if we look at things like pain for example, I see lots of pain clients in the North Sydney Clinic, lots of digestive issues, um, there's a lot of that these days, um, IBS, constipation, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and then the more sort of chronic long-term things, I tend to see cancer patients, whereas I know other friends of mine, for example, see a lot of diabetes patients. It sort of depends on the person. I would really like to see acupuncturists specialising a little bit more. Um, I think that's a real way forward, personally. So if there's something very specific that you want treated, what I often say to people is, I always say to people, actually, the, the biggest thing about finding an acupuncturist to work with is that you need to connect with them. And so find the right person to work with you. And then if it's something quite specialised, I would try and find someone who has a lot of expertise in that field. That's what I would say. One quick one. Yeah. QI. What does QI mean? Second. QI. Chi. 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 So, yes, oh, I didn't say that before, did I? If we go back to that one you there. The word of energy, yeah. Yeah. So, chi is the Chinese word for energy. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, 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 so, well. yeah. So, we talk about, so obviously in this setting, in acupuncture, we talk about chi or energy flowing in the channels. But in yoga, for example, they talk about energy flowing, energy flow in yoga, but it's called prana in, in the Indian or the yogic sense. So, it's this concept of energy. You are, no, yeah, I wasn't no, thinking of no that at all, sir. Uh, one other thing. Mm. Have you had acupuncture treatment yourself? I have extensively, yes. Uh, okay. So you know... You know what the pain is, do you? I do, and I think the thing is as well that the thing, the uh, the idea behind the the pain or the, is acupuncture painful? It's it's funny because it obviously is very it's a very personal thing. But most people, like I had a client tonight, I saw just before was treating treating her for hot flushes, and she said to me, it's her second section of acupuncture, and she said to me, it's not painful, is it? People always think it's going to be painful, and it really you, I mean. When the needle goes in, you might feel the tiniest sharp prick because it's a needle going into your skin and we have pain receptors and pressure receptors in our skin. When the needles are in place, I do give them a little turn because I want you to feel them, but the sensation often just is a little sensation or almost like, um, some people say it's like an insect bite. <laughs> Some, you know, it's a small sensation, so it's not particularly painful, no. 
Um, I can vouch for the fact that it's not painful at all, I'm having acupuncture for a number of years. Um, after that first four treatments and assuming that is successful, yep. what's the sort of ret average return time after that you know, before you need another bout? Sure. Another session. Another sessions. So often, what I see is, um, depending on the symptom, I'm going to use pain because pain is something that often responds fairly quickly and fairly well to acupuncture. So within four sessions, what we've hoped to have done, or whatever we're treating, actually, is reduce it to a manageable level where the patient feels, yep, I'm doing pretty well in my day-to-day -day life. And between sessions, as in between maybe the third and the fourth session, they feel like they've gone through most of the week on a manageable state. That's not to say the pain isn't there, but it's manageable. So if we get to that point of the fourth session, what I would probably be saying is come back in two weeks' time, because then two weeks' time later, hopefully I'm going to see them, and they'll say to me that the first week was pretty much fine, and most of the second week was okay, but then it was starting to get a bit more by the end of the second week. We do a top up that second week, and hopefully two weeks later they've got through okay. And so either they come back two weeks later again or three weeks. And then I do a month, and then I normally say to them, I'm here, you know where I am. When you need to come back, come back and see me. And that's dependent on when they come back. A lot of people, they might come back for something else, and I say to them, so how's the lower back? Or completely fine still. So it's really person dependent. But generally I say when we get to a good point of managing symptoms, about once a month. Some people come back because they find it really relaxing and they really enjoy it, so they come back sooner. It's just patient dependent, yeah. I've got a couple of uh, yes, no answers, and I just want to go through this fairly quickly. Sure. What's the relationship between uh, the nerves and is it communicating to, I'm calling it needle to brain? Yeah, it's, this is such a good question. So when we take a look at, um, for example, with pain, like why does acupuncture work with pain? Um, we talk about this concept of circulation in these channels. Um, by placing the needles into the channels, we hope to increase the circulation. And actually, um, this is going to be a multi-layered answer, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, when the needles go in, we often see a redness around the needle on the skin. That's blood flow. And I don't mean just a pinprick where it's gone in. Often you can see a red patch, depending on the person, around the needle. That's increased blood flow in that local area. Okay? The theory holds if we get local increased blood flow, that also deeper down in the tissue there would be increased blood flow as well. That's actually the theory behind the IVF and helping women conceive there a bit too. So we get local increased blood circulation. When we also use needles for pain, it does work on the nerve system. So what they actually think happen is, there's a number of theories, what they think happens is that when the needle goes in and we give it a little turn and you feel a sensation, that creates a local small little impulse in the skin and then that's transferred to the bigger nerve network which then feeds up into the brain. In terms of pain, what they talk about is that there's an altered sensation coming out of the, pain, out of the brain back down to that site again. But what we also know is that opioid peptides are released when we do acupuncture, which are natural pain relieving chemicals in the body. The diagram there, I, I would call it a circuit, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then what I'm trying to work out here is that uh, something flows through. Is it something like a, a, a nerve or is it, is it like a, a, a hose inside? Or, you know, what, what you put the needle in, you mm. twist it. And is there, does that make a signal and does that transmit that and flow it somewhere or yeah. is that what's happened? The Chinese, because they didn't talk about nerves like two mm. millennia ago, the, the concept of, you know, it wasn't there two millennia ago. They talked about this concept of qi. So when you feel that sensation, they talked about it in terms of qi and the Chinese, the meridians. In, in most cases, in this day and age, we talk about it in terms of nerves, but it's not just working on the nerves. It works on other parts of the body, like the blood vessel network. They've shown, actually, that nitrous oxide is released when you do acupuncture locally as well. And one of the um, effects of nitrous oxide is to increase permeability of the capillaries locally too, so the blood vessel network. So there's movement, there's other things going on there than just nerve channel or hitting nerve channels. Mm. I'll pass that on because I would like to pass something that I don't. Thank you. Mm. I should come clean and say that we actually have acupuncture every month and have been doing for about the last 10 years. Wow. Um, 
but primarily we're here just to see what you had to say about prostate cancer. I mean, my husband uh, has uh, hot flushes and that's about all, mm. thank God. Um, but his, his surgery wasn't successful and he had brachytherapy and that sort of thing. So we have been having acupuncture every month for, as I say, about the last 10 years. And I just wanted to know what particular areas that you you would particularly aim for or treat um, for prostate cancer generally. I mean, I think our acupuncturist basically tries to work um, on our energy level. Um, I mean, we seem to get them from head to toe all over, up to 36 needles. Wow, that's um, a lot of needles. It is a lot of needles. They can go in your head, your ears, your face, your chin, your down you know, into your wrist. So I don't know, does she, is she doing everything just to cover all? I mean, we feel really good when we come out. I mean, yes. there's no question about that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Is she just covering their whole immune system or, or is she overkill or, or what? Acupuncturists work in different ways. So um, obviously they're, we're all state registered now, by the way, acupuncturists in New South Wales. So um, yeah, everyone, no one can do acupuncture anymore without being state registered. And that's, although it was a, an, a massive pain for me to get it, because I did both my degrees in the UK, it's a really good thing for the acupuncture world to be state registered um, so so that she's fully qualified basically if she's practicing so that's obviously a plus point um, I don't normally use 36 needles on one person um, it would but if she can use them on you and if you walk away feeling okay I mean maybe it's a bit tired that evening or no if you walk away feeling okay then that would say to me that she's the treatment that she's doing or your energy more likely that you're able to take that treatment if I put 36 needles in some of my cancer patients I'd wipe them out <laughs> I, would, I would literally they'd be exhausted because there's lots of movement going on with 36 needles basically um, so so one, kudos to you, because you're obviously able to take that treatment. Um, and if you feel good afterwards, then for me, that's a positive, and she's obviously doing the right thing. Um, yeah. In relation to what I would treat specifically with prostate cancer, it would depend on the history, the background of yourself, obviously, like the medical history, but also on other body systems and, you know, what was before, what is now as well. And then you know you make a treatment based on those things. I don't know if she's ever talked with you about the concept of damp. Does she talk about your Chinese medical things? No. no. So there are different ways of looking at things in Chinese medicine, and often um, cancer, prostate cancer, is to do with something called damp in Chinese medicine. And so she might be doing a lot of work on that, for example. That can be a really long-term treatment, um, like if she's specifically treating that in your body. The other thing I just want to say as well is that I don't talk about treating the cancer. So I work with the oncologists here and I work in the medical institution and the treatments that I do are holistic, so I do work with the body's energy, but I don't talk about treating the cancer. Um, I treat the side effects of the cancer, but of course I do also treat the overall underlying um, constitutional kind of patterns that are there as well. Right. That makes sense. Mm. Thank you. That's, thank you. Okay. Susie, this has been a very interesting session. Thank I've got you. three questions. Okay. The first one is almost trivia and sort of curiosity. What happens if somebody's an amputee? Yeah, I interesting. You know, amp amputation or amputees are really interesting because you've heard obviously of um, phantom limb pain um, when people have pain in a, and also actually even in I've had patients who've had pain where they've had the gallbladder removed, for example, as in that's where they believe it's still coming from. Because of the concept of energy or chi, um, it's actually something that physicists talk about a lot because they understand energetic medicine a lot more than, I'm a biologist, a lot more than biologists do. It's still there even though it's not there. So the channels that you were talking about before, these channels are energetic. They're not, you can't see them. You, and again, physicists will get that because they talk about energy being, you know, it's basically just matter, it's stuff. You don't have to see it to know that it's there. But so it's still there, the limb, even though it's not there, the energy of it. And so that's where you know, that phantom limb pain comes from. If you're asking me what happens with them, as in because I can't treat that side, mm -hmm. if you look at the channels there on the body on the diagram, they're symmetrical one side to the other. And the theory holds that you can treat one side. You can treat, you can put needles in one side to treat the other side. Okay. I'll move on to the more serious questions. Okay. Um, I found your session very interesting, but it seems to me that what you're talking about in all of those symptoms that you're trying to treat um, could just as easily apply to patients who are not cancer patients. Um, yeah, possibly, yeah. Right. So you don't have to have and um, bear cancer sufferer to get through the door to uh, for these treatments.
treatments to be just as you have outlined them and just as effective as you've outlined them in your session tonight. That's, I think that's the point I'm trying to make. I'm trying to get a Yeah, of on. course. I mean, I see people who have hot flushes from menopause, not from having um, hormone replacement. And the way that we treat is possibly slightly different. I think it's more... Um, in Chinese medicine, they don't qualify, obviously, about someone necessarily having cancer. It's about the things that people present with, the symptoms, but then also about the underlying constitution as well. So, no, someone, you know, you can treat someone in a similar way, but maybe not the same way, who have these symptoms, who don't have cancer. Okay. I want to come back to the question of holistic medicine now. Can I just say one other thing actually as well, which is probably why I talk about treating side effects, because I'm treating the side effects of biomedical cancer therapies, I'm not treating the cancer itself. I'll Understand. just say that there again, yeah. Understand that. Sure. Um, in uh, starting off with a new patient and yeah. you review the patient's circumstances mm. and their symptoms and what you think is um, the underlying cause of that, yeah. are you not at a somewhat of a disadvantage compared to the biomedical world when they've done all of their investigations and uh, a whole lot of facts and data have come out of those investigations that um, when you're sitting down with me as a mm. patient and I'm talking to you, yeah. I'm telling you what I remember, I'm telling you what I'm biased by um, being conscious of mm. rather than the full facts that are somebody in a more traditional biomedical situation Are might you, have. I suppose it depends on how you view that in a way because um, I'm not going to use, I mean, I do. <laughs> I look at the blood work if someone brings it in. I'll look at scans if people bring them in and those sort of things, but that's, it's more kind of, it's, that's just me because I've got that sort of biomedical world that I will look at that side of things and I'll look at other markers on the bloods that maybe other people wouldn't look at necessarily even the oncologist just because I know sort of what they mean a little bit. But I don't use that for my treatment. My treatment is based on what the patient tells me. So yes, you're, you're saying in case, in terms of if someone's forgotten or they've got, give me an example. I have a limited, I, I have a limited amount of time with you in the consultation. Mm. So I'm gonna talk about the things that are pertinent to me and that I'm very conscious of in that particular time. Sure. Which is not necessarily the full ambit of things that, um, as I sit here now, perhaps should come out in a holistic um, review. Can I just also say, when you do an initial consult with me, you're not the only one doing the talking. <laughs> so I'm going to be asking you quite a lot of questions as well. So even if you don't tell me anything about your bowels, for example, I'll be questioning you about those quite specifically because they're a big part of what I do. I'll ask you, I'll go through your head area, your chest area, you know, those sorts of areas, and I'll get a general picture of what's going on with you. It suggests to me that when it comes to a holistic review, you've done this more often than me. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, I was uh, just going to make a comment rather than a question, really. I've had a couple of treatments. Um, I was actually being treated for chronic sinusitis mm. for, with acupuncture. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, I just happened to rupture my quadriceps tendon. And I was, he was therefore treating me for both things because I walked in. He said, what have you done? <laughs> yeah. Or oh, I didn't walk in. I went in on crutches. So... Uh, but as a result of that, I do know, and the surgeon was actually, actually uh, Dr. Gutrinich, who's on the um, Rogues Gallery up in the, up in the hospital there, mm. and he couldn't believe how quickly that that healed up to the extent that I didn't have to have physiotherapy after that. Excellent. And the other thing about the relaxation, I can recall vividly lying on the couch and the needles in me, and I'd start to see these visions of little clouds on the ceiling. <laughs> And they started off very light grey, and when I was really relaxed, they turned pink. <laughs> and I related. Amazing. It, I related it to my colleagues at work, and one day I came back from a session, and some smarty had put a pink <laughs> cloud up on the ceiling and, and painted on the ceiling in my office. Um, uh, the other thing, this is a bit of a silly question, really, but um, you did mention about um, treatment for. Um, Erectile dysfunction. I was mm. just wondering where do they put the needle? 
I always get asked that question. I always get asked that question. Um, they put needles in different places, but again, the reason why I was talking about needing to understand the reason why that's happened, because yeah. that would affect treatment. So I was having a chat with a friend of mine who's um, doing his PhD in uh, breast cancer and acupuncture. Well, actually, sorry, he's doing breast cancer and he's doing herbal medicine, which is not something we really do here. I'm not a herbalist at all. and. Um, because of obviously the problems with taking herbs are if they interact with your medications mm. issue there. But the this guy was saying to me about how um, depending on the reason for the erectile dysfunction, for example, that he would recommend someone to have acupuncture and herbs or just acupuncture. To answer your question, so the reason why I'm coming back to that is because when we take a case history and we understand why it's happening, it would affect where the needles, we place the needles okay. in the body. But we don't place needles in the genitals, no. <laughs> um, that doesn't happen. Um, but we do probably the lowest point on the body is um, a point around the pubic vein area and that probably would be used. Um, there are also points kind of in certain areas of the body that are known to really strongly increase circulation. And on erectile dysfunction actually as well, I read some research recently that was talking about yoga and talking about how, if anyone does yoga, how yoga really strongly um, increases f circulation and flow in the pelvic area. And so there's been a lot more written about how that could be a really positive thing to do in the treatment of erectile dysfunction too. So, interesting. Susie, are some people more responsive to acupuncture than others? Um, yeah, they are. And it's really hard to know why that is. Um, because I've had some real doubters. I don't mind having doubters at all because I was a bit of a doubter, I think, when I first studied. You know, I was a, I was a biomedical student, student, so when I came and I started studying acupuncture, the anatomy physiology, the pathophysiology disease, all that stuff was fine to me. Concept of yin and yang could not be more foreign. I mean, yin and yang, what do you, what do you mean? Everything's got yin and yang in it, and it's like, what? But um, after time, obviously, and getting an understanding. So doubters, I don't mind. I've had doubters who've responded really well, and they've been as kind of shocked, you know, as, as anything. And are there different forms of acupuncture? Like, I've been having acupuncture recently on muscles on the neck. Yeah. And for, I just couldn't move my neck. Yeah. Three sessions, mm. three needles. Yeah. It was amazing. You don't feel them except for when it goes into the knotted muscle. Yes, and it goes... And then <coughs> it, it, the fibres just seem to go away from the needle. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? You either feel, um, especially with the traps up here at the top, um, you often get a contraction of the muscle fibre when it goes in. Mm -hmm. I always say that's a good thing, even though it's a little bit tender, because as the muscle, basically, you're stimulating the muscle to contract, and as you contract it, what you hope is that then when you release it, it opens up a little further, right. and you get better blood supply, fluids, and energy, of course, chi through. I feel fantastic now. Yeah, <laughs> but there are different kinds. There's a lot of people you'll see now, like um, chiros and physios who do acupuncture, and they do something called trigger point acupuncture. So they're basically taught in a weekend that you put a needle into a muscle and get it triggered. The kind of acupuncture that we do is obviously quite different from mm. that. Um, I think they all have their place. I think, you know, in, in lots of ways, I think lots of um, modalities have their place. Integrated healthcare is how I see healthcare going in the future. Um, which is why I kind of want people to specialise, so that you have people who are specialists in those areas. Mm. Um, there is something else called Japanese acupuncture, which is um, more superficial needling. It's a slightly different theory to the Chinese acupuncture. Some people find that gentler. Um, children are often treated, my son doesn't like acupuncture, although he's, he's subjected to it at times if he needs to be. Um, you don't leave needles in children until they're of a certain age, obviously, because they don't sit still ever. Um, so with children, you can do something, there are different techniques, it's called shonishin, which is kind of like pediatric Chinese medicine where you use um, either pointers, so there's not needles that pierce the skin, you can use laser on them, um, and yeah, sort of rollers, it's a, it's a different sort of form um, with the same roots, but a different way of applying it for children. Mm. There's one more question. Yeah, I'm just sort of wondering with acupuncture if it would affect somebody who has memory loss, if you could use it for that. There is, um, there is with, yeah, with long-term memory loss or short-term, long-term. Um, there's something written about both sides, actually, long and short-term memory loss. Um, yeah, I haven't, personally, I haven't treated that um, specifically in clinic. It, yeah. One more? Possibly. 
Yeah, because I think the theory would hold basically that it's about a deficiency in the body essentially. And so you work at trying to nourish that deficiency. I'd want to look into it and look at the research on that probably before I um, would treat that. Um, I will say also that at the SAN, although I predominantly see cancer patients, I also see um, carers, um, so support people for the cancer patients. And sometimes people bring their mums in who, um, I had a patient's mum who was having some problems um, and she came and had a series of treatments with me and she was a, she was a lady actually who was a bit of a doubter actually um, and she had the most amazing results and loved it. She came back, she was in her 80s, came back after the first week and I said, how did you feel after the session? She said, I felt totally high. I was just really relaxed, and, <laughs> but in a nice way, you know, so it was a real positive kind of relaxation side to her, to her treatment. Well, that's basically why we do it, to be proactive rather than any other way, just to, to make sure we keep on top of things and keep ahead of things. Yeah. And, yeah, I think it's great, I think it's great. And it really is relaxing, isn't it? It's, um, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah <laughs> People always say, oh, sorry, I fell asleep. So, no, that's, that's a good thing. You're in that level. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I suffer from uh, misspent youth. Too much sport, and I've had every jo uh, joint in my body operated on. Okay. And what I'm concerned about is after you've talked about all these channels, yeah. uh, does that excessive surgery muck up that system at all? Mm. The traditional Chinese way of looking at it, it's like someone having a C-section. We see lots of C-sections these days. They talk about basically C-section cuts across the woman's tummy. There are channels, as you can see, that run there. And sometimes after having C-sections, and even years later, there can be some disturbances in that area um, or in these channels. And so they do work, we do work with people basically to encourage that flow to kind of almost flow again. Um, with uh, pain and joints and things, um, I'm going to talk about from the point of view of a broken something, but just say you've broken your wrist, in terms of circulation you're seeing that you're not going to have the same circulation of blood, fluids, everything, energy in that area. Um, so of course with surgery you can get scar tissue, or you can get areas that don't work as well. Um, you might find that acupuncture releases some of that pain or stiffness. Um, I didn't mention it in here actually, but something else, I don't know if this is something that you guys suffer from, but the breast cancer patients with the aromatase inhibitors, they get a lot of joint um, aches and pain, kind of like arthralgia, um, arthritis, a little bit pains. And that's something that the, um, the surgeon, uh, Michael Hughes, was um, saying to me, uh, was saying to sorry, one of his patients recently, he's had a number of patients who've seen me and really have helped with those muscle aches and pains, like virtually gone after a few sessions. So it, it kind of, in that sense, it really could help. It would depend on where it is, why it's there, and you know. Mm. Last question. Is there any connection between acupuncture and reflexology? Um, so reflexology is a different system um, as in a different theory. It doesn't come from Chinese medicine. Uh, it's more based on when we look at the maps of reflexology of the feet that certain areas relate to certain parts of the body. And reflexologists basically work on the feet and they can feel certain kind of almost like grains of sand or something in that area and they work to smooth those out. Um, it's amazing. I love reflexology. If you haven't tried it, you should really try it down here. It's very relaxing and it can have some really good benefits. Um, occasionally, and this is true actually of any modality, including acupuncture, people can, I always say this to people as well, 24 to 36 hours after having acupuncture you, and reflexology or another kind of modality, you can sometimes feel a little bit unwell, a little bit out of sorts, I'd actually put it at. Um, I don't know if you've ever had osteopathy or anything like that, but again, the same thing there. You just feel a little bit, and it's almost like the changes that you're trying to say to the body, everything's gone a bit, and then it kind of settles down after a sleep normally. Um, so that's the only thing I'd say. Love reflexology, but not the same, no. Mm.